All right. Hey, folks. So we are back for the March Q&A. Um, I ended up getting a cold, so this is why it's a bit delayed. I've not done any videos for a while, but I'm pretty much back up to speed now. So let's crack on with the check-ins. Now, I have been looking forward to doing this because there's some really good questions. We're going to start over on Instagram and we'll go right into this question, which is a very relevant question for what we've been discussing on the channel for the last week or so. So this is from Justin. Justin's also a subscriber on YouTube. Um, and we've talked a bit in DM, seems like a nice guy. He says, if you're in tune with your RAR, should you leave one or two reps in the tank for the major lifts? Now, we've had quite a lot of talk about RAR, and RAR, for those who don't know, is reps in reserve. It's basically a measure of how hard you're working in the gym. Now, <laughs> the confusion around RAR, typically in my experience, revolves around people's interpretations of how hard they're working. So for one guy, what might be working very hard to the point of almost going to failure might be for another guy, easy work, you know, because people have different interpretations of what it means to take something to failure or close to failure. So we need to have a scale where we can accurately gauge what exactly does it mean to be at zero RAR. And zero RAR, what it should be is if you attempted the next rep, you'd fail. So it's very, very hard work. One rep, one RAR is basically, you could do one more rep and then the rep after that you fail. Okay, so you get the idea. Now, to help to illustrate that, I wanna just show you a quick video off my Instagram. So if you're on my Instagram, go ahead and check it out over there. But uh, this is a video that I did of my leg extensions the other day. Now, this is a set where I would consider it to be zero RAR. So had I attempted one more rep, I feel like I would have failed. So I think first indicator that people generally look for is facial expression. <laughs> now, you can see from the beginning here, this was just a hard set. This machine is set up really well, so you get a high degree of resistance right from the beginning, so right the way through the full range of motion. And you can see here, I'm taking the reps through the full range of motion, so there's no cheating any harder portion of the rep. Now, what I'm looking for is slowdown of the reps, because that bar speed, bar exercise slowdown tends to indicate difficulty. You can see there, I start to slow down at the beginning. Now, if you roll into the next rep, this is where it gets very difficult. And if we actually put a timer on that, the entire rep takes about eight seconds. It's a very, very difficult rep. I figured had I gone for one more there, I would have failed. So that's the level of intensity that I consider to be zero RAR. It's difficult to see from this video, but if you go over to my Instagram and have a look at it, it's a hard set. Now, I don't believe many people are working out that hard on a regular basis because I just don't see it. Um, but that is what I, would, what I would consider to be zero RAR. Some people might consider one rep prior to that to be zero RAR because it's all in their minds. So if we are talking about a true one or two reps in the tank, I personally feel that's fine on the major lifts. I don't think that's a problem. The issue arises though, when we say that on YouTube, we get there's this sort of romantic attachment to working hard and intensity it's a very sort of i don't know puritan ethic way of looking at things like everyone wants to say i work hard raw but if people aren't working to that degree and considering that to be zero rar on a regular basis for every single working set it's kind of like they're trying to be in the cool club without paying the dues everyone on the internet apparently trains that hard all the time, every time. However, I mean, I don't see that with new clients that come to me. I don't see that with anyone in the gym. So yeah, I mean, there may just be a bunch of really special people in the YouTube comments, but um, I'd be willing to bet if people really took stock of themselves, they probably are actually leaving one or two reps in reserve, which goes back to the original question by Justin, is it okay to do that? It is if you make up for that with appropriate levels of additional volume. So this is where you see my routines. They, my routines pretty much sit right in that zone. Pretty, pretty, pretty moderate to high rep, high volume routines because I value this type of training. Like I understand what it means to go to failure. I trained to failure for a large portion of my life. As you guys know, who watch my channel regularly, I grew up about an hour away from Dorian Yates' original temple gym and the entire 
community around the whole Midlands area was focused on training to failure and training hard. So I understand that if I want to do the level of volume that works for me, which is quite high degrees of volume, 15 to 20 sets per muscle group per week, I need to naturally reduce that intensity down. So it's a tricky topic. And as evidenced by the video a week or so ago, it becomes with a lot of misunderstandings. But in any case, my general feeling is it's okay to leave one or two reps in the tank with the proviso that you have to make up volume. You have to, you have to be on a fairly high volume routine if you're going to do so, moderate to high. If you are a minimalistic guy, so if you're doing a low volume routine, let's say you're doing something like eight to 10 sets per muscle group per week or less than that perhaps, you know, six to eight, then it almost begets you to have to train to failure. And this is where the rubber hits the road because you're looking at that point where little too much intensity can be injurious for some people, not for everyone, but it can lead to injury for some people. I know for me it does. Low volume for me is injurious and it just retards my progress overall. My muscle building progress stops. Super high levels of volume become an impossible task to do with any degree of intensity because of the time commitment it requires in the gym. So people end in that middle zone of about 10 to 20 sets, which the research says is, is about right. I mean, it's, it's quite simple to understand really if you think about it in that way. That's the midline. If you're going below that, the intensity has to come up. If you're going above that, intensity has to come down. It's that whole volume intensity relationship. So when I discuss these things, I don't have this sort of romantic macho attachment to intensity because I've been there, I've got the t-shirt, I have nothing left to prove. I have a cupboard full of trophies. I have nothing left to prove. So I don't need to display my manliness online to say how hard I work. So I can discuss these things objectively to say, actually, in my experience and that of most people I work with, it works a little better to do a little bit higher volume because most people just don't train that hard. If you're one of the few people I've met in my life who is capable of training that hard, and trust me, I can name them on one hand with three fingers, then sure, go ahead and do a low volume routine. But it's unlikely that you are that special person. Just have some humility when you're when you're thinking about that and when I'm discussing these things. So yeah, great question. Um, in general, yeah, leave one or two reps in the tank, but also be very much aware of what one or two reps in the tank is. It's very hard training. Okay, next question by Ilian is, thoughts on the Penley row as a main backlift? Yeah, good question. Um, short answer is, I'm not a big fan. I'm just not a big fan. Um, the long answer is, the reason I'm not a big fan is because I don't feel the lower back should be the limiting factor in a lift or an exercise which is designed to target the upper back, the lats, the traps, everything. Just in the, like in the same way, um, I personally would wear lifting straps if my grip was to fail me on deadlifts. You know, I always wore straps when I was deadlifting for powerlifting, always. And I never had a problem with my grip in, in the competition. I never lost a, comp a contest deadlift because of my grip, never once. And I always trained the straps. I always train with straps for two reasons. One, I didn't want to be lift, limited by my grip. But two, I didn't want to develop any unevenness by having a sort of a mixed grip. And I found in my early years, when I was doing a mixed grip, I, it led to a, an imbalance in my shoulder girdle and my back. So I went to double overhand, better, far better for me. Um, double overhand with straps, and I never had an issue with, uh, with deadlifts. In, in competition. But back to your question, you know, I don't want to be limited by my grip when I'm deadlifting. In the same way, I don't want to be limited by my lower back when I'm bent over rowing for my upper back. So I don't consider it to be a very good exercise. My clients will tell you that every client that I've got sort of intermediate to advanced, I don't program in bent over rows. Um, everything is chest supported for those guys. For beginners, I do because I think there's value for beginners because of the whole nature of the exercise. The, the entire full body nature of the exercise. But um, yeah, for, for anyone else, no, I don't think it's a good idea for that reason. Okay, James Mack says, how to combat joint pain, particularly in the elbows and wrists. And he says he deloads regularly, but it just happens as soon as he gets back to lifting. It's a very easy answer to that, James. 
you're basically doing too much. I know that kind of sounds obvious, but I think these things have to be pointed out, you know, for people to really appreciate them. But you're doing too much. Your particular combination of volume and intensity is too much. So going back to Justin's question, going back to Justin's question, we were talking about finding the balance between volume and intensity and finding your sweet spot. With you, you're you're screwed over to one side. You're just doing too much, either volume or intensity. So either the volume you are doing is too high or the way you're performing that volume is you're too close to failure. One of the two, something's got to give. And again, this is kind of why it's useful to have lifting, a lifting language, okay? Because I can talk about volume with you, James, in terms of number of hard sets. I can talk about intensity by talking about RIR. So if you are currently doing, say, 15 sets to failure per body part per week, okay, the first easy solution is to reduce either the volume or the intensity. So if you're training everything to failure, then okay, maybe we can go and leave one rep in a tank. Fine. And stick to 15 sets. See if that helps because you're pulling back a little bit. If that still doesn't help, deload again, come back, pull back a little bit more. Maybe go to 12 sets per body part per week with one rep in the tank. See how that goes. See how that works for you. You see, this is why lifting language is important. Most people seem to be okay with viewing volume in terms of number of sets. But as soon as you start to discuss RIR and RPE as a scale to discuss intensity, people go crazy. But um, this is why it's useful. Hopefully, you guys are seeing that now because I've discussed it in my last few videos. But this is why it's useful. I can give you that advice, James. Whatever you're doing in terms of volume and intensity is a little bit too much. Pull back on one of the two factors. Frequency isn't that helpful to talk about because it's really just a consequence of your volume in my experience. So I'm mostly talking about here about intensity and volume. So yeah, you've got to pull back a little bit. Frankly, you're just doing too much. Simple. I would like you to be able to train without pain. Pain inhibits how hard your muscles, your muscles fire as well. So your brain senses pain and it will stop you from firing the muscles hard. So it'll actually make training hard. It'll tra make training less effective. This is one of the reasons why people should deload. So let's go to the next question. Hopefully that was useful, James. Next question from Justin. This is a really good question. Justin is asking about, I won't read out the whole question. I'll just summarize it. Justin's asking about the eights, fives, and threes. He's saying, is, he's asking, is there any possible chance or possible reason to stay at the same volume tier before you go down? So if those of you who aren't familiar with, that eight, with my eights, fives, and threes, it's a rep scheme that I have, which has become relatively popular. And it's in my book, The Tactician. But there are nine volume tiers in the eights, fives, and threes routine. And he's saying, is it worthwhile staying on one of those volume tiers before you move, before you increase weight? So let's just kind of pull back a little bit and let's discuss why rep schemes are so important. Because I've got mine, uh, Steve Shaw from Massifying has got his, really good one. Now, there is no magic in these rep schemes. Um, and placebo is a very real thing, so maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but um, just to give you guys the inside scoop, there's no magic. Like, there's no magic. Between doing three sets of 8 to 12 versus my 8 to 5 to 3s versus Steve's rep scheme versus wave loading versus any of the number of things, dynamic double progression, any of the number of things, there's no nothing special about I, any of them. It, there are just ways to keep you on track and to prevent you from doing a bunch of dumb, unrelated stuff every single session, right? So going from three by eight to three by five, one session, three by 15, the next session to 10 by 10, the next session to five by five, the next. It's just something to keep you on track because keeping you on track means you can progress relative to the week before. Like if you go from five by five to 10 by 10, you, you don't, you can't progress. You've got no idea what you're doing. But if you stick to my set and rep scheme for a number of months, it allows you progression because it's a well thought out set and rep scheme just like a number of others on the market. So there's no real there's no real magic in it. The important thing about these rep schemes is they allow you to create small progressions over time. That's it. So you ask if it's okay to stick to the same weight or yeah, the same sort of, you know, whatever progression. 
yes, it's fine. As long as you understand, these rep schemes are designed to keep you forward thinking. They're designed to keep you adding weight to the bar. That's the important thing. Like people can do like three by five or five by five for years and just stick to the same weight because they're just, they never feel like they're ready to move up. But these rep schemes, the, what's good about these rep schemes is they're always forcing you to go up. So just be, just be careful that you're not falling into that trap of just being too comfortable. Okay. Something I used to say, something I say to my clients now is I don't mind if you try and fail, but if you don't even try, it's a, it's a problem. And I used to say the same thing in my classroom as well when I was a school teacher. It's like, no one's ever going to tell you off if you try and fail. Like, it's fine. But if you refuse to try, well, that's a problem, right? So just don't make the mistake of just falling in love with your poundages and never progressing. But as long as you're, you, you're aware of that, you should be okay to stick to the same weight for a session or two. Sure, why not? I mean, there are there is an argument to be made. On the other hand, there is an argument to be made for for not always increasing weight because there are other ways to progress. When I was younger, we used to call this owning the weight, okay? It's a separate discussion, but I'll just talk about it briefly. I was going to do a video on this. But just briefly, owning the weight means just cleaning up your form. You know, and just not even your form, really, but cleaning up the sets. So let's say you did, I don't know, three by five with 100 kilos, and it looks scrappy. You're bouncing the bar off your chest a little bit. Um, you weren't quite locking out, and it was you took ages between sets. You took like five minutes between sets. Well, okay, let's say you spend four weeks on sticking to the same sets and reps and the same weight. But by the end of those four weeks, the reps look smoother, they're paused, right? And you only take two minutes. Now, even though it looks the same on paper, could anyone realistically say that you didn't progress? Of course you did. So you don't always have to add weight to the bar to show your progress or to be able to progress. You can just tidy up those smaller Factors like rep speed, pauses, uh, cadence, rest between sets. You can you can you can improve all of those, and still create more of a stress on the muscle, which will still allow you to grow. So yeah, there is an argument for that as one. Well. As I say, it's a video I'm going to make at some point. We used to call it owning the weight. But anyway, next question. Ayan says on the bench press, should the heels be flat on the floor or not for optimal leg drive? I'm really struggling on the bench. Yeah, interesting question. I'm going to approach this one in two different ways. Firstly, let me just answer the question straight off. Um, it depends on you. The difference between feet on the floor versus on your tiptoes is really down to federation. It used to be acknowledged that being on your tiptoes allows you to have greater leg drive. And that's what was used in federations which were a bit more loose with form, such as most of the equipped federations when I was younger. The, the, the federations that I always competed in, your feet had to be on the floor. So that was the BDFPA, British Drug-Free Piloting Association, as well as um, the what used to be the IPF. Um, so, sorry, what you know, what used to be Baller, British Amateur Weightlifting Association. When I first started competing, they were still Baller. They eventually split off into what is now known as the IPF and the GBPF. So this was before the days of the IPF. Um, I competed in Baller. British Amateur Weightlifting Association, and they always re request that your feet were flat on the ground. I'll tell you the story about why that split up uh, another time if you guys are interested. It was to do with the Olympic weightlifting and funding. But anyway, so yeah, the the, the, the basic answer is it, it's whatever allows you to get more leg drive because that was only split decision due to federation. Your toes should technically allow you to get more leg drive, but it's not true for everyone. Now, the more nuanced answer is this. Why are you getting leg drive? Could, could anyone care to explain that for me? Why is a non-powerlifter looking at getting leg drive? Because as far as I know, I am, you are interested in hypertrophy primarily and strength really as a side effect of hypertrophy. So yeah, sure, you want to get stronger, but ultimately you want to get bigger and leaner. And you're not competing in powerlifting. So why would you be interested in, in leg drive? Why, why would you care? I mean, what is leg drive going to give you in terms of your development? I, I'm confused. I've been confused about the whole leg drive thing for a while. <laughs> I, I, I should clarify at this point. When I say confused, I'm not. What I actually mean is I don't know why people are emphasizing leg drive so much unless they're really 
really interested in strength. Like there are a few YouTubers out there like Bald Obney Man who talk about leg drive. Great. Like strength is his thing. Like, yeah, he's physique as well, but strength is a big part of what he does and what he teaches to his clients. Great. Awesome. Love that guy. He's right on. But for a guy who's interested primarily in hypertrophy, why are we emphasizing leg drive? I mean, it's it's going to allow you to lift more weight, but I don't think it's going to translate to the mass gains that you think it's going to translate to. It's kind of the equivalent of getting somebody to tip the bar up. Why? I think you're barking up the wrong tree. I think you're better off looking at your programming, your volume, your sets, your reps, your RIR, which I know you're uh, maybe not such a big fan of, but I think you're better off looking at your programming before you look at, like, basically assisting your bench press is what it is. Okay, let's go over some of the questions. All right, here we go. All right, uh, our hero, which I think is Raymond from YouTube. Raymond says, how do you get past a sticking point with a weight on an exercise? Okay. He also goes on to say, for a man over 50, should all work sets be taken to failure or just a lat set? Okay, now here's the thing. So it's kind of what I said originally to Justin. I think you've got to be able to do what you need to do to progress and whatever is your particular combination of volume and free volume and intensity. Those are your two major levers to pull. Okay. So firstly, actually, you know what? Firstly, that before we go into training, let's talk diet. Okay. Yeah. Let's leave the training discussion for a second. Let's just start at diet. One of the most important lessons for any beginner, and I don't know if you're a beginner or intermediate or what you're, whatever you are, but one of the most important lessons that I teach my beginners is the first plateau has to be solved via food rather than training evolution. And the reason I start my beginners on that early is because they need to understand right from the beginning that there is a one-to-one -one relationship with training and diet. Training and diet are inexplicably linked. And a really, really powerful way to break out of a plateau is to manipulate your diet. Now, that doesn't always mean gaining weight because you may have been on a gaining phase for 12 weeks, 16 weeks, 20 weeks. At that point, it might mean actually maintaining and cutting back to restore insulin sensitivity, to restore P-ratio, which I am a believer in. But manipulate, body weight manipulations over the course of the year are very important to be able to get you to progress at the best rate continuously across the whole year. I'm not a big fan of like a 12-month book. It doesn't make sense. My background is in competitive sports, powerlifting, strongman, uh, bodybuilding. At no point do people just bulk endlessly. Even bodybuilders know full well that if you have a year and a half before your next show, you don't just spend the entire time in a surplus. That's not the way it works. There are specific bulking and cutting periods because you tend to grow the most out of a cut. And at a certain point in your bulk, you just stop gaining muscle. So diet is, a, is firstly uh, an important one to look at. And based on that, it may be time to change something in regards to your diet and what direction you take your body weight in. And as I said to somebody in my DMs just recently, just bulking into oblivion is not the solution to everyone. Now, assuming that's one factor you're going to look at, the next factor is you have to decide upon your own particular blend of volume and intensity. Now, let's say you're training, you're recovering fine, you're not getting sore, you're not getting achy pains like James before, and but you're still not gaining anything. Odds are you could probably do a little bit more. Now, your question is, should I take everything to failure? Well, I said do more. Now, that could be more volume. It could be more intensity. But either way, you need more in that situation. Now, let's go to the other side. Let's say you're training hard, your diet's in order, but you're always beat up. You're like, oh, I just feel horrendous. Like I'm doing all this work in the gym, I'm doing loads of work, and I can't recover from it. I just feel horrible, but I'm going to keep on going because... Steve, Shaw, and Faz told me to keep going. And so I'm going to keep pushing, but you're beat up all the time and you just feel horrible. Well, clearly you're doing too much. Pull back a little bit. I think everyone needs to learn to evaluate their own signs before they look at generic programs. You'll notice in all of my eBooks, I provide guidelines and tiers. So low volume tiers, medium volume tiers, high volume tiers, and variations for, and advice for you to actually find your own 
correct amount of volume and intensity. I don't think generic recommendations are great. And yeah, sure, it's an ebook, it's a 15 pound ebook. So how much detail can you give in that? But, you know, at least there is some in there. And, you know, my clients actually you know, get a lot more. But I try and present as much of that story as possible in, you know, a 30 page ebook. So, um, yeah, ultimately for you, Raymond, we have to decide on three things. One, what direction your diet is going in. Two, are you doing too much? Three, are you doing too little? And then adjust things based on that. I'd love to give you a simple answer, but it's not that simple, unfortunately. It'll it'll require a bit of thought on your pro, on your part to determine. Okay, am I doing too much? Am I doing too little? Is my body weight stagnant? Do I need to do something there? And, and decide on that moving forward. Okay, and also same question from Raymond is: Can you do drop sets on the Wizard program? Okay, good question. Good question. So. Firstly, let's just talk about sets. Like, what are sets, really? So, what are we looking for when we do a set? Now, what we should be looking for when we do a set is, I guess, the fatigue, the stimulus and the fatigue which comes from doing that set, right? Towards the final few reps of the set, maybe the final five to 10 reps of the set, they tend to be more stimulating than the previous reps, if they were. And certainly the last five tend to be the most stimulating. This is what we know from the research. The last five being not the last five you do, but the last five before you hit failure. So if you're you know, training really easily, not very well, then maybe only one or two of those reps are, are actually stimulative. You know, But uh, I don't think it's wise to say that just the last five are stimulative because that means the previous five were completely not stimulative, which is not true. We know that's not true. But they are certainly less stimulative. Which is which then goes to the which goes back to the question. Okay, what are we looking for with a step? We're looking for those stimulative reps, which are typically about five reps away from failure. So when we do a drop set, what are we getting? Well, when we do a drop set, let's say we do a main set and one drop set, two drop sets, three sets altogether. We are getting three of those effective, stimulatory, fatigue-inducing reps, okay? So let's say I do a set of 20 to failure, right? And then I rest for, I don't know, 10 seconds. And then I do another set of 10 to failure, and I rest for 10 seconds, and I do another set of five to failure. Well, I've gotten five, 10, 15 very, very effective, stimulative reps in that time period. So effectively, it's kind of like doing three sets. So I don't think there's anything special or magical about drop sets. Uh, or really, if we can look at, we can expand that to any intensity technique. So that could be um, giant sets, supersets, whatever. It's just a case of how much fatigue does it actually produce? How much stimulation does it produce? And then count your sets based on that. So yeah, I, I think it's fine to interchange drop sets with regular sets. The biggest reasons for doing so are quite simply time, because all of these intensity techniques, they allow you to do more work in less time or just allow you to do more work full stop in the same time, or variation. So if you're doing it for those reasons, that's good. If you're doing it for any other reasons, like for example, if you if you just believe they're somehow magical because you read in an article that some guy did drop sets and now you think they're special, then you're wrong, like they're not special. They just, or a way of inducing the same type of stimulation and fatigue that a straight set would do, but with less time. That's it, and they give you some variation if you need that. I think one area where you have to be careful or careful of when it comes to any intensity technique is because of the short and rest time, you've got to be careful that you're not taking away from intensity from your main sets. So if you do three drop sets with no rest in between, and by the third set, you're just, your aerobic system is fatigued. You're just like, oh, 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 you're gasping for air. You can't do the set justice. Well, that's not the same as a regular set. It's not, it's clearly not. So oftentimes when I program in drop sets, I will program in drop sets more like down sets, but I will do maybe 30 to 60 second rest. I don't feel an immediate drop set is a good idea for most people because you're probably going to be limited by just lactic acid buildup by central fatigue, by even nervous system fatigue. 
And again, it points back to the whole idea of actual trading intensity, whether people are trading as hard as they think they are. Usually they're not. So I think if you, this is one of the reasons why those intensity techniques, they tend to be better off for people who are intermediate to advanced. Odds are, if you're before that point, like maybe early intermediate or, or beginner, you're probably not delivering the level of intensity you need to actually train hard because you wouldn't be looking at these things otherwise. So yeah, I think they're fine, but they come with a lot of provisos. If I was coaching you, I, I would have to see a lot of those sets to see if they are actually hard, hard stimulating sets. Because if they're not, then you're kind of just wasting your time. Um, okay, I think we're going to call it there. So I will get this up and I'll see you, that's what she said, and I will see you in the next video. Take care.